All right, time to talk some baseball with the great John Book Shambi from ESPN. Book, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Jared, good to see you, brother. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to see you, and it's been great waking up to see you sometimes doing oh. some ABO baseball. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm staying up late for the beginning, but I definitely wake up early for the, the beginning and the middle. I know it's uh, been a, a different start to the baseball season for you. What, I'm just curious, what are some of your takeaways or things that stand out about the KBO and what you've witnessed from a baseball standpoint? All right, well, start, the baseball standpoint, everybody wants to know what the level is. I think that you can't do it across the board. They, there are different things at different levels. The defense is, is especially poor. I, I don't think they play – if you do college baseball at a, at a high power five level, it's not as good as that. It's like it's really, it's really below par. That's one of the disappointing things. Pitching, average fastball velocity is 88.3 miles an hour, but there's pitchability and guys know how to, you know, they've been around, they know what they're doing. So, you know, the pure stuff isn't there. They got guys that can hit. I mean, make no mistake, and it's different than Japan. Contact is, is certainly emphasized more than in the United States, but – they're looking to lean on stuff. Like, you don't see a lot of bunting. They're trying to hit three-run homers. So hitting is the skill set that plays the most. In terms of what we do, yeah, it's just a lot. It's, it, I just, it's like log rolling. I basically, it's like I'm log rolling for three and a half hours and just trying not to fall in. You, know, you get the lineups 30 minutes before first pitch. Obviously, the names are hard. If you have them down, it's not that hard. But we control no shots. So – if somebody doesn't get us the information and there's a pinch hitter, he just appears. We come back from break and the starting pitcher is 25 and the new pitcher is 45. The names are in Korean. And if he doesn't turn, you know, I'm doing externally, welcome back, KBO on ESPN. Internally, I'm going, is that a new pitcher? I think that's a new pitcher. It might be a new pitcher. Um, you know, we, we try and prep as best we can. I think we've gotten more and more informed. But you, we can't even technically, because we don't have the shots, because they may just roll in a highlight from a game from two weeks ago, we can't even give you a standard play-by-play -play call. So we turn it into a little bit of like a talk show slash play-by-play -play format. Um, and there have been moments that have been fun, and there have been, you know, four hour and 27 minute nine inning games. You know, we had a game the other day, the first inning, we don't take a break in the middle of the first and from sign on to the end of the first, I think it was 46 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send a copy of that to you. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, you know, you, you've critiqued a lot of my work in the past. I'll be sure to yes. watch that entire clip and, and send you put that. that. You put that on, you put that on like right before bed and <laughs> I, I, I you, you, you get yourself a really nice night's sleep. All right. Well, thankfully, we've got the light at the end of the tunnel for Major League Baseball. And oh. we, yeah, uh, knock on wood on that, uh, just over a few weeks away. So I know you're, you're definitely gearing up for that season. I, I'm curious, uh, just with the, the 60 game setup and, and all the, uh, the, the, nuances to this particular season what are the things that you're most excited to to see or witness or, or I guess uh, I don't think you know I, as much as there's new stuff I don't think I'm that uh, I just want to see baseball I think you know you think about where we'd be at this point you know th this is the time of year where I mean we'd already be into the season it wouldn't be new you know what I'm saying? Like when you're July, you know, first week of July, you're talking, you know, second week of July, you're, you're into it. Yeah. And so I'm just looking forward to seeing games. I, I understand the runner at second rule because you need results. I'm personally someone that advocates for ties after 12. I, I just, the more we watch the, the way the game is, I, I personally, I think it's silliness that you – I mean, 162 games is an absurd amount of games. And then to decide that those games are going to be played in perpetuity, that we have games in the middle of July that can go five or six hours. 
is fundamentally stupid, in my opinion. Um, it is one of the things in Korea, just for reference point, they play 144 games. They do ties after 12. You know how many ties there were in the league last year? Seven. It'll be fine. Yeah. We'll be fine with ties. And just win more games. I know, I know, America, we don't like ties. I know. I get it. All right? I get it. We'll be fine. Like, we don't need to be playing five-hour games. Game 85 doesn't need to be five hours. It's dumb. Just my opinion. I, no, I, I agree. I actually, I had a really good conversation a few years ago with Tony Barnett, who played in Asia before he came back and played for the Rangers. And, and he was explaining essentially the same thing. And he was the first person with whom I talked who, I guess, sold me on that idea. And I, and I don't like the runner at second thing either. And I've done some, some Frisco games here on TV where they've, you know, they've implemented that at the minor league level. And I just – I don't know. It messes with the stats. I don't yeah. love the, that part of it. I want, you know, I feel like we should be able to attribute. It's one of the things I like is what's knowable. Attributing things, you know, well, who, whose run is that attributed to? You know, what were the key factors, that type of thing? And now you have these sort of outlier stats that you're not sure what exactly they're connected to. And I just think, look, here's my – the best argument I could give you for – it, it, like one of the problems in baseball is there are still too many things that the answer to the question, why do we do it that way is because that's the way we've always done it. And if you started a sport today and the first thing I told you was we're going to play 162 games. And the next question was, well, what happens if it's tied after nine? I guarantee you there is no way that the decision would be, so we'll just play till they finish. It, six hours, seven hours, like no way. They put a limit on it. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's that, look, that's not one of the bigger issues in the sport. The sport has bigger issues, that's for sure. So well, I want to ask you this. I, someone floated this idea to me, Mike Bassick, former, former pitcher. Yeah. And Mike is not afraid to say something that might just not make sense at all. Right. Uh, and he said something, and when he when he shared this idea with me at first, I was like, no. And then I started thinking about, it, and he he brought up a couple years ago whether or not it would behoove baseball to split 162 games into two halves, like minor league baseball. And his reasoning was, on June 1st, if you know your team's out of it, you still have four more months to sit through. And maybe, you know, depending on your level of fandom, that might mean four more months of watching meaningless baseball, or maybe it's just not watching at all because you don't really want to follow a team that's, you know, 15 games out by July 1st. Yes. And his thought was, you know, you, you're going to re-engage fans in the middle of the season. And so yes. the total amount of days yes. over a 162-game season in which a fan is following a team that is competing for something goes up. Yes. and I don't know whether it's that or it's or increasing the playoff size so that more more teams, more fans are. are I like that in. idea. I, I would be more interested in in doing it that way than increasing the number of what. Like one of my biggest beefs with this year is this: if you're going to do sixty, and I know that there's you know money and agreements from these the the MLBPA and the league. But pushing all that, you know, small stuff aside, um, <laughs> I, my the one thing that I thought was a must for this year, it's different. I'm frankly tired of, you know, how many games will it need to be in order for it to be legitimate? It's, it's a silly exercise. I mean, you guys are a good example. If the Rangers win, if the final out of the season – or the winning run is scored by the Rangers. I don't care how many people you have listening to this podcast. Like, they will be just as happy as if they won it in 2010. Like, at that moment, they will be just as happy. I promise you. They will be just as happy. Now, that said, what they should have done this year is they should have turned the playoffs into a tournament. Because over 60 games, my buddy Joe Sheehan made this point. 60 games is so much different. Last year, the Mariners started 13-2. and two. Mm -hmm. 
If you start 13 and two this year, you have guaranteed yourself you're going to contend. 13 and two in 162 game season, and then blah blah. But you go 13 and two to begin the year this year, you're in it. You're in it. And so with that, you're going to have outliers in 60 games. So turn the whole thing into a free for all then. Turn the playoffs into some type of memorable postseason tournament with 16, 20 teams, do it that way. That's what I would have done. I don't like that it's 60 games and then it's the same postseason that we've been watching. Make it different. Yeah. And now I'm – and then, okay, so what do I want next year? Yeah, 162. I don't want to see more playoff teams, though. We don't – baseball does not have a, a postseason problem. Baseball is a regular season problem. Yep. No, I would agree with that. I mean, that's – again, I, I that, that June 1st example, that's – from June 1st through the end of our regular season is the entirety of the NFL season, you know, and, and we still have two months prior and then six to eight weeks prior to that is spring training. And then the, the only point I would make is they don't really like football in Texas though. No, not at all. No, we're, we're, no one's concerned about high school football right now until when yeah. or not that's going to going to take place. Yeah. Uh, is there anything from a strategy standpoint that you've considered that, that is interesting to you about how teams might approach this year that they wouldn't otherwise in a 162 game season. Yeah. Okay. So the one thing I'm interested to see, and I'm, I'm doing this right now, like, like you're getting, you want to, you're getting a glimpse into my soul. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. So if I guess basically it's this, it's in the extra innings, um, in the extra innings, what uh, are we going to see teams bunt more? Because the bunt is dying. In the American League, the, the non-pitcher bunt is dead. And in the American League, you never see it. However, and why you glimpsing into my soul, I pulled up my run expectation matrix, right? So here's what you got. With a guy on second and nobody out, you have a 61% chance of scoring. With a guy at third, so second and no out, 61% chance. With a guy at third and one out, it's 66%. So that is actually an example of where the bunt is the better play, where you're trying to play for one run. I, a lot of people have speculated on it. The two things we've seen is intentional walks and and – bunting or dying I got no problem with that but in this instance might we see might we see um a resurgence in the sacrifice bunt that's I'm sort of interested in what uh the 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 players opting in or opting out I guess they're 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 more actively opting out I don't know that you need to necessarily opt in you just show up but is there anything there, do you expect more? I mean, as of this point, we've had a few big names. David Price, you know, Nick Markakis recently said that he's he's out. We've had yeah. some guys, you know, some big names test positive here in, in, in DFW. Joey Gallows tested yeah. positive. Uh, what do you th – I mean, how, do you think more players are going to opt out or do you think that we've already seen the bulk no, of No, I think more players are going to opt out. I do. I, I also would say this. I've been – a little surprised, and I, I, I say that without judgment. I've been a little – this. Is, so this is what my expectation was. I've been surprised um, that players have been open and expressive about fear. That, that even guys that are, that are playing have been like, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable. I mean, Chris Bryant was quoted, I think it was yesterday, as saying, I thought I would come to the park and feel safe, and I don't feel safe. Um, so I, I've just – I've been – I didn't think they'd say it. I mean, I think they have very good reason to yeah. to, to be a little concerned. And, and I would I, – I think that mainly it's, it's the, the extended circle. It's they may have a pregnant wife. They may have a – a parent who is um, compromised or older. So I think we're still going to see more players opt out. I also believe that, you know, I, I do think that stuff on, 
on the periphery can affect what happens. Like if testing gets screwed up or more players test positive and it's sort of break even point, if in the country we start to balloon to 80,000, 90,000 cases a day, which is obscene, I don't think – I think there is some type of tipping point where even if things are going swimmingly inside the bubble, if outside the bubble people are absolutely freaking out or it continues to grow and get worse, we, you know, it, it, I think it may get shut down. I might be wrong on that. Do, do you think – okay, so let's reverse that Mariners example. Random team starts 2-13. and 13. Yeah. Do you think at that point we see a, a player or players say – no. We're not playing for anything. It's not worth it. I'm, I'm done for the rest of the year. Or well, The only thing with that, I mean, you can. I, the only thing that I read that I wasn't I – will, I will confess this. I've done an interesting thing, and it's just for my own psychology, but, I, but I'll tell you. Man, I, I haven't – you know, now I'm prepping, but I didn't stay in it because, like, I couldn't deal with the roller coaster ride. So I was less connected. So I, if I read this right, like – People were talking about, you know, well, somebody like Mookie Betts, uh, you know, opting out because the season's so short and blah, 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 blah. But he doesn't get the service time. Service time, right, yeah. So I, I don't know in, ter in terms of that. I thought you were going to ask me if somebody goes 2-13, and 13, are we more likely to see a trade? <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think so, but – do you, okay, well, I guess it, I, I wasn't planning on asking about this, but have you had any time to really get a, a sense of whether you think the trade deadline will be more, less, or the, yeah. or the same level of activity? I mean, I it, like, you know, look, I understand it. If I was in your shoes, I'd ask questions like that. How does it – you know, like, the, the one question I've gotten the most is, okay, a 60-game season, what teams might be – what teams might end up being constructed to take advantage of it? But I don't know about – but, like, my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, me neither. My brain works towards who are the good teams. Yeah. And the good teams are still the Dodgers and the Yankees. You know what I mean? Like, 162 games, who do I think is going to make the World Series? I think the Dodgers and the Yankees are making the World Series. 60 games? Yeah, I'm not changing my pick. Yeah, I – I, you know, the one of the storylines here is that, well, the Rangers, for the first time maybe in franchise history, are going into a season in which their starting rotation appears to be way better than the lineup. And some people have now asked, well, wait a second, does having these five good starting pitchers hurt them in a 60-game season? And I don't, I don't understand the concept. If you have good players, it's going to help you no matter whether you're playing six games or 600 games. Yes. Uh, it, it may not play that way. Like, I, I, I'm totally with you. It's like, yeah. So, I would, I would want to – I mean, in this instance, you might want to have a few more bullpen arms, like good bullpen arms, because guys aren't stretched out. But, like, having a good rotation, you know, if – the bottom line is this. If, let's say all, the, all your pitchers start their 32, but – well, let's call it 30, and they have 10 great starts, 10 bad starts, 10 medium starts. Well, you don't know when those are going to come. So the point being, maybe all five guys have six of their great starts. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, yeah. you just don't know how – like, trying to figure out when guys are going to play well, I'm not down with that. I don't think there's anybody that can do that. So, you know, one thing that's, that's interesting to me, and, and I think – well, two things, and it, it really has to do with the future. So, I'll use the Rangers as an example, but yeah. I think every team probably has cases like this. So, from a player standpoint, this was supposed to be the year that the Rangers were informed enough on whether or not to move forward with Rugnet Odor as their second baseman because – He's, gosh, you know, every year he's put together a stretch of around 60 games where he's been outstanding, but right. then it's the other 102 where you're kind of – and I don't know that, you know, you, I don't know how you can make a determination based on this season. Right. And so I'm curious to see what sort of decisions get made or aren't made based on this smaller sample size. Because some, in some cases you can wait another year on a player. Uh, right. In other cases, you know, those decisions have to come. 
And then the other side that's interesting to me, so the Rangers, you know, and, and anything can happen, you know this, but I'd say that if you were to handicap the Rangers before the season, you'd say that, well, if they got off to a really good start, you know, they're, they're, with the idea that they're going to get to a, a win total over 162 games, it's kind of the 10-10-10 example you just used. We don't know when they're going to get to their 82 wins or whatever. Maybe they get off to a great start or maybe it's a, a, a strong finish, but they, they were in a position to possibly make some, some moves for the future with some of their arms if those pitchers are pitching well. And I don't know that anyone within the organization thought that this was the year to, to really go for it, but if on August 27th they're sitting a game up on a playoff spot, but then a team comes calling for Lance Lynn and is willing to give you a pretty appealing package, yeah. do you still maintain that future focus or are you, are you – beholden to this idea that, hey, I'm a game up on the playoff, you know, and I, I just, I'm curious to see what sort of decisions teams make when it comes to those sort of elements. I, you know, these guys are, it's interesting because most of them nowadays are more analytically inclined, which is a little more progressive. They're still by nature conservative. They just are. On Rugnet Odor, by the way, just to give, like, you guys get to watch it every day. So you ride the wave. But Rugnet Odor, for the last three years, his slash is 219, 285, 419. And you're talking about an OPS plus. Uh, it's 22 points below league average. Like, that's a no. It's a no. Yeah. There's nothing to figure out. There's nothing to fi- – like, you can sit there and look at those – like, that's below average, man. That's not a little below average. That's a lot below average. All right, I got one last question. And yeah. there are, by the way, there are plenty of Rangers fans right now who are throwing a party with you saying that. Uh, okay. Because it, I think Rugnet Odor might be the most polarizing Rangers player when it comes to the, the fan conversation. Right. All right, you, I could give you a million guesses, and you're not going to be able to guess what my last question is. It's totally not okay. un- unrelated to anything. So I, I thought about this again recently because I interviewed Sean Green. And with Chris Woodward as the manager, I think about the Blue Jays randomly every once in a while. Okay. Why did Carlos, why is Carlos Delgado not getting the love that he deserves? I know he played in an era where, yeah. you know, a lot of people hit home runs and, and whatnot, but I went back and, and I looked, career. yeah, I look, I looked Monster. at his numbers. It's unbelievable. We're not talking about a guy who maybe hit four. I mean, he almost hit 500 home runs and I don't think he lasted yeah. on the ballot for one year. Totally. What what am I what am I missing about why he's just not I get I get that era is tough for people to 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 you know parse, but like what that that guy the career was unbelievable. Okay, so a couple of things. The let's start with this. The process stinks. <laughs> okay? Like I, I will tell you this. I can't that, I love your question, by the way, because that I'm I'm in a I, but I will tell you. I don't give a crap about the Hall of Fame anymore, man. I don't. That's okay, like, well, hold on. Let me, let me stop you. I, the, the Hall I, of Fame is cool. I, I'm just more thinking in general, like when we talk about that era. But, he, but the point is, he's someone that should be getting consideration. And, like, if you comp him to a Fred McGriff, it does get kind of interesting. Um, I just think that sometimes it gets it gets lost, and I think that the that in retrospect, the Hall of Fame candidacy, um, yeah, it ends up sort of factoring in how we filter guys out and and what type of career they had. I don't think most people realize how good Carlos Delgado was. He was he was amazing. He's one of my one of my favorite. You know, I mean, you appreciate this as a play by play guy. My favorite, just stories that I would use a handful of times a year about a guy, Carlos Delgado, left-handed power, but he had great left-handed power to left center field. Like he had really great oppo power. And the story is that his father would throw him BP as a kid and he'd take a crate of balls and he'd dump them out on the mound and he'd throw BP and he'd take the crate and he'd put it at second base And he said to Carlos, every ball you hit to the left of the crate, I will pick up. 
every ball you hit to the right of the crate, you will pick up. And that's how he developed his power to left center field. I wonder now if uh, the way hitting is taught, if that's reversed, if uh, you got the dad saying, hey, don't – anything you hit to the opposite field, that's on you. I'll get everything you pull. That's right. Uh, That Yeah, that's uh, – I. and I'll, I'll, I'm sure you do this too. Uh, I'll, I'll just start thinking about random players and I'll yeah. go on a, ba- a baseball reference wormhole. Sure. And, you know, two hours later, I'm, I'm sitting there frustrated because of this or that. And, and I did that recently with Carlos Delgado. And I used Absolutely. to love his, I, I think when I was younger, I loved his batting stance. So I always had a uh, yeah. soft spot for him. Yeah, absolutely. Really good player. Really. I got to know him a bit in his time. He was down in South Florida, but I got to know him know him a little bit he's uh he had a really good career boog we really appreciate it and uh looking forward to to hearing you talk about and, and call major league baseball hopefully here in a in the few in a few weeks and yeah always good to talk baseball with you back at you brother good to see you